let's uh, let's pray okay. father god we we thank you lord for this day we thank you lord for your presence in each one of our lives father god yes lord we just want to thank you for that you know let's just take some time to thank him for for his presence in our lives for without his presence in our lives we are nothing without his presence in our lives we are incomplete without his presence in our lives there is no um, there is no good thing and so let's just thank him for his presence father we thank you that you dwell in us lord we thank you that you chose to make, lord make us your dwelling place father god even as we received you as lord and savior we thank you for washing us with your precious blood we thank you father god for you consider us o oh god as your temple o oh father god lord as your dwelling place father god we thank you master lord what an awesome privilege it is for each one of us lord to have the god of heaven and earth or dwelling in us we thank you father god we acknowledge that this morning god father yes lord let that change us father god Lord, let that change the way we relate to you, Father God. Let that change the way, Lord, we relate to people, oh, Father God. Yes, Lord, let that change. Let that revelation sink deep into our hearts, in our spirit, oh, Father God, that you indwell us, Lord, that we, even as we choose to abide in you, Father God. Lord, we pray for, the, for a manifestation, oh, God, of your presence, of your glory among us, Father God. Yes, Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Continue to lead us. Continue to speak to us, Father God. And Lord, I pray this morning, God, that there would be a <clears throat> that there be an impartation of your strength, Father God. Lord, or some aspect, oh God, of who you are, Lord, to our hearts today, Father God. And let it touch our hearts. Let it manifest, Lord, in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirit, oh Father God. Yes, Lord. One facet of who you are god let it just overwhelm us this morning we thank you we bless your name god we bless your name lord yes lord our hearts are open lord for what you want to do in our lives master we thank you we give you all the praise and all the glory in jesus matchless name we pray amen amen okay, okay so um We've been looking at uh, worship ministry last uh, couple of sessions. We looked at um, you know, some aspects of worship ministry, what worship ministry is going to be focusing on right? Uh, in the first couple of sessions. And then we, we started by looking at the altars, altars that, uh, that were built, uh, altars that was built by Abraham. And that actually gives us quite an insight into uh, the concept of altars, the concept of worship itself, the idea of worship itself. And uh, we see that, um, you know, uh, that actually kind of draws us to God and gives us a revelation of uh, what we can offer to him in our worship, right? So it, it's much bigger, we know, we, we always know that it's, you know, it's bigger than just the songs that we sing, right? It's much bigger than that. It's a life that we bring. It, it's about ourselves, right? Uh, ourselves. Uh, giving up ourselves as an act of worship to God. So um, so we can draw so much from just by studying those. Right? We also looked at uh, this aspect of singing and music. And uh, we looked at the, the, we looked into the New Testament, right? We looked at the Psalms and then uh, which talk about, you know, when we can worship, how we can worship, where, etc. We looked at some of those uh, questions. And, um, we looked at uh, we also looked at the the old testament talks about you know the tabernacle the the world old testament talks about the temple and uh, also um, you know the the tabernacle of david so we see all these references to worship so we looked at that okay so uh, today um, uh, we look at okay um, we also looked into the new testament you know so this whole idea of is the kind of music or worship that that was there in the old testament does it is it valid in our day and time and we are we not in a change of dispensation after the cross and did not the lord say that you must worship in spirit and in truth and therefore you know is there a place for you know music and singing and all that in the new testament times and and we looked at some scriptures um, that just like how there were synagogues uh, and uh, and it was the kind of worship that happened. Uh, the, the early believers, you know, as we look at it, the apostles and the others, they were Jewish people, and the kind of worship they they continued on into the synagogues and the homes. 
and we see references in the gospel also right like the lord jesus um uh, at the in the upper room when they had that that last supper and uh, when they moved from there it says that they sang a hymn right so which we get an understanding that yes singing was part of that okay so the importance of uh, you know when it comes to singing uh, how when there is music when there's melody the same thoughts or same um expressions whatever thoughts that you want to communicate um become so much more powerful because your emotions are involved right so sometimes when we want to say say it uh yes there is a set, certain level of involvement from our side personally when we say it okay, our heart is involved but then when we actually sing it and when there is melody you know there is Uh, the involvement the engagement of our being is so much more right and uh, and also yes there is a danger in that because it can just become a, an aspect of song or music but um, but we know that their engagement is so much more um when uh, engagement of our soul engagement of our spirit is so much more right okay so today what we're going to do is uh, look at take a look at the uh the kind of worship that happened in the tabernacle of moses right so uh, let's uh um, yeah i think we can turn to page 16 in our notes and you can follow it there so the tabernacle of moses right okay let me just share some pictures here um, just one second sir Okay so uh Tabernacle of Moses what do you know what can you share about the Tabernacle of Moses anything that you can share anything that you understand anything that you share who built it ha huh? Yes. So, when was it built? And the Israelites built it. Yes. Any, any, I think the first semester we had a detailed study on this. I think, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. So, please, what what is it that uh, you know? All that you know about the Tabernacle of Moses. Online students as well. outer court inner court okay so you know that there are different sections okay what was the yeah go ahead go ahead just whatever whatever comes to you whatever you recall about the tabernacle of moses yeah mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so there was a sacrifice yes sorry are there uh -huh. okay right when you suppose they they have to find something in this right because this was talked about this every point okay right right okay so there was a there was a sacrifice involved and there was a the whole ritual of uh, what was uh, where the blood was taken after the sacrifice and uh, what the priest would wear and uh, it's only uh, you know at certain times that the priest was allowed to go and they would tie themselves um, bind themselves to a rope like you said and and why would he do that why would he tie a rope around him around his leg or around him and go yeah and the right 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 so so the thing is that um, 
you know god being infinitely holy and uh, the fact that okay if he did anything that was not appropriate okay and if he died if he was struck down if he died and no one else would dare to go in right so they didn't want to go in and they didn't want to lose their lives so they would just pull the rope and you know pull the you know the dead man out and they didn't want to risk their lives right so um, so you see all these safeguards and everything okay so i see holy of holies child and then um, after the people of israel agreed to follow his commandments god made this covenant to come and dwell among themselves yes that's right and so we see that um, you know that was the intention right uh, that was god's desire so uh, if you go to exodus 25 okay 25 to 27 that gives the the entire descriptive picture of uh, god's heart right um, god's heart for for the tabernacle what he wanted the entire description very detailed right um 25 verse 1 it says then the lord spoke to moses saying speak to the children of israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart you shall take my offering okay so from everyone who's giving willingly you take the offering and then it goes on to say what is the offering and the purpose of the offering okay so uh, verse 9 it says according to all that i show you that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings just so you shall make it and then he goes on to say so 25 26 27 all these three chapters talk about various aspects of the tabernacle okay what should be done what are the uh, what are the uh, furnitures or what are what is supposed to be there in each section and all that okay so so we'll look at it we we'll, let's look at it um, you know uh, section by section right okay the first thing that we see is that this tabernacle is a shadow and type is is the pattern of it is something that is there in the heavens okay that is something that we see right uh, if you look at hebrews 8 you know that's it talks about that okay hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 um okay uh, it says now <clears throat> this is the main point of the things that we are saying we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the lord erected and not according to man or not by man and then if you look, go down to verse 8 or is it okay verse 5 uh saying who okay let's look at verse 4 for if here on earth he would not be a uh, if he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle tabernacle for he said which means he is referring to god see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain okay so it says these priests these earthly priests they serve a copy and a shadow okay what is a shadow you know when the light falls on the actual object you get a shadow right the light falls on this and there is a shadow of this so so he's saying okay they are serving the copy and shadow but what is the true thing it is actually a tabernacle which is made not by hands not by man but by god erected by the lord himself in the heavens okay so that is something for us to understand that Okay, there is uh, this heavenly tabernacle or heavenly sanctuary and uh, the true uh, tabernacle and then the shadow of which was what was put up on in the earth and which was uh, which was again divinely instructed and designed and everything it's according to the pattern which was showed to um, uh, Moses right okay so we see that um, he built it 25 to 27 talks about that and chapter 40 also uh, you know talks about that uh, exodus uh, chapter 40 okay so so let's look at it okay uh, let me just share uh, j- just a picture okay 
Just one second. Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so you see um, the several sections. We have the outer coat, right? Then where you have the bronze laver. Okay, it's basically a big vessel which has water for ritualistic washing. Then there is the altar where there is a sacrifice which was made. And then we have what is called the inner court, which consists of the holy place um, and also the most holy place, or what is called as the holy of holies. Right? Then we have several things in the inner court. In the uh, holy place, we have there's a altar again for incense to be burned. Okay. So outside in the outer court, we have an altar for burnt offerings. An altar is a, an elevated place. And it's all again built with certain specifications, right? So here inside we have this altar. It is for incense to be burnt. Then there is a another table, uh, which is another uh, item, which is the table, and where there is bread. Okay, and uh, it talks about what it's called as show bread, and it is there. Okay. Then opposite that is a lampstand, or what we would call as a menorah. Which is uh, which? Which has seven, uh, you know, seven. Um, what you would call? Okay, uh, seven lamps burning, basically, right? One in the middle, and then three on either side. So seven, right? And then, in the most holy place or the holy of holies, we have the ark of the covenant, okay, where, and on top of that is a mercy seat, and it's just one unit, but. Uh, the Lord says that he would meet with uh, Moses there. He would meet with him there. Right? So, so we have this one elaborate arrangement. Okay? So um, if you look at it, what, what does it signify? It looks at, you know, if you see that, it's, it's, actually, a, it's actually a journey. It's, a, it's like a pathway. Right? It's a map. When someone comes from the outside and goes all the way to the inside. Right. Now, did everyone have access to the Holy of Holies? No. It was only the high priest. And could he go there all the time? No. It was only once in a year that he could go. So we'd had these restrictions, but it has this elaborate pathway. And it was a pathway to the presence of God, like to the very presence of God. Right. So it talks about God being infinitely holy. You know, you get the understanding of the holiness of God. You get an understanding of the limitations or the sinfulness of man. And God saying that, you know, all this is there. Uh, so that man would also understand the holiness of God. right? And man would also understand where he stands with regard to the holiness of God, the infinite holiness of God. right? And man would also understand what it would require for man, for humanity, to be to relate to God, right? To come face to face with God, to um, to uh, to be in His presence, and so on. So, what it would take, right? It also showed that, well, that God is someone who is infinitely holy. God is someone who cannot be approached casually. God is someone who, you know, at that point, point, you know, I'm just talking about that dispensation that God is someone who is, uh, uh, who, you know, whose holiness is, is terrifying, actually, right? Where a person could lose their lives in in such an atmosphere, right? So that is the that is the majesty and the holiness of God that that we are talking about, right? A, a person would just understand that so just imagine you know for a, the high priest would literally be trembling right that day he he wants to do everything right he wants to do everything uh, you know according to what was what was uh, all, what was divinely given according to everything he doesn't want to miss out on anything and you know he, because he could literally lose his life there right everything ends there so 
So he must be in fear and trembling to go before this awesome and holy God. At the same time, it shows us that this God, this infinitely awesome, terrifyingly holy God, is reaching out to man and saying, you know, I want to meet with you. Right? He's saying, I want to meet with you. Right? And uh, where you could, there is a provision for your limitations, your sin to be dealt with so that I can cover it. And I cannot, you know, I, I cannot bear, bear sin, but then I will, uh, you know, there is this <clears throat> offering, this sacrifice, because of which you're, you know, I can make it what you call as an atonement. I will cover it for a period of time. And, uh, and, and so it talks about God reaching out. You know, this, even though he's amazingly, awesomely holy and terrifyingly holy, worthy of this respect and reverence, it shows the heart of God in reaching out to man who is sinful. Right? So we see that God is the one who takes that initiative and gives that design and says, you know, I, I actually want to tabernacle with you. I want to interact. I want to, I want you, want to speak to you. I want to communicate with you, and so on. Right. So the very first thing. Okay, let's look at. Um, let's look at that. Um, the first aspect of it. Okay, if you see that there is a gate, right? There is an entrance. There is a gate. Okay, and um, and this is also mentioned. If you look at Exodus twenty-seven, the gate is also mentioned. The gate is also given uh, some importance, and it is also you know you uh, talks about some the design of that, right? Um, let's just read that. Right. Um, Okay, verse 16, I think, uh, yeah, 20, you're looking at 27, verse 16. For the gate of the court, there shall be a screen, and it talks about the measurements, right? 20 cubits long, and it's woven of blue, purple, scarlet thread, and fine woven linen made by a weaver. It shall have four pillars and four sockets, and so on, right? So it... It talks about a gate. It talks about what covers the gate, and uh, it's a gate of the court, the the courtyard. And it talks about the colors of the of the threads of the uh, that will be used in order to weave that um, you know th that particular uh, covering for that gate, right? And and so on. So the gate also has significance. It also has some. Each each part of this, you know, as we read, we see that each part of uh, the tabernacle has significance. Significance meaning importance, <clears throat> and each item, <clears throat> sorry, each item in the tabernacle also has some importance to it. It has an important. It has a meaning. It has an importance. So when we understand it, we see that, um, yeah, when people did it physically, when they went and did it, they could. Touch, feel, see, and and it was it would stay with them, right? Even though it is a copy, a shadow of something that was in the heavens, right? Okay. Let me just share uh, the notes. Let's look at. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we looked at the gate. Okay, so there are several references to the gate in Scripture. Gate itself, right? Um, if you look at uh, Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Right? Um, the door or a gate, right, is an entrance to something. You open the door in order to enter into a different environment. Uh, different setting, right? And uh, the door or the gate gives you access to it. Right? So for us, just for us to think about it, okay, in practical terms, this is what a gate does. Okay, And the Lord Jesus, uh, he says in John chapter 10, 
and verse 9, John chapter 10, when he's talking about how he is the good shepherd and how the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he's talking about himself as the good shepherd, right? And he talks about how the sheep enter and, and, the, and the good she the shepherd gives his life for the sheep and so on. Um, and in talking about that, the Lord Jesus also says in verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and I will go in and come out and, and will go in and come out and find pasture. I am the door or I am the the entrance way or the gateway, right? Uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6, the Lord says, I am the, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father through me. Okay, uh, was that a question? Yeah, yeah, Nina, please go ahead. You have a question, Nina? Um, sorry, I can't hear you. Probably you have to mute, unmute, and I see your raised hand. By mistake, is it? Okay. Okay, okay, fine, fine. No worries. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah. So so the we see that uh, the Lord himself making a reference to himself as the door, as the gate. Okay. And then we see that um, it was made of um, the purple... The color, of, color is also mentioned, the color of the threads that were used, purple referring to something that is heavenly. There are you know, scriptures that talk about that. Um, I'm not getting too much into details of that. And purple, you know, referring to the royal color or uh, purple, uh, def purple refers to royalty or kings. Kings would use purple, right? And, uh, and then scarlet, which is, which is a reddish color, uh, it symbolizes, uh, symbolizes uh, sorry, um, it's signifying blood or sacrifice, suffering, etc. And then it also talks about linen, fine linen or white um, in color, which was which refers to purity, holiness, righteousness. Right. So we see that the gate. The Lord refers referred to Himself as the door, uh, and uh, uh, that He is the doorway, and He is the only doorway through which we can enter in. And here we see that uh, these colors, again, signifying, pointing to Christ, right? Um, whether it's the blue color pointing to something that is heavenly or purple, whether it's royalty, you know, we know that Jesus is the king, um, the soon and coming king, whether it's scarlet, referring to the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice of the Lord, by the Lord, um, white or linen, referring to Oh, sorry, sorry, sinlessness, yeah, without sin, righteousness, right? So we, we see that as well. So, so we see that um, you know these colors also at the, the 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 fact that these colors are there at the gate. You know, just just imagine, you know, this is this is years before, centuries before, millennia before the Lord Jesus Himself came in, came to the earth, right? This is the this is millennia before the sacrifice on the cross right and here we see this pattern that the lord gives moses saying that this is how the gate should be okay so isn't it amazing right so we see the <clears throat> infinite wisdom understanding of god right so just just beyond our human understanding and therefore you know it talks about uh, the perfect, the sacrifice that was prepared before the foundations of the earth. Right? So we we see that we get a, some understanding of it, <clears throat> because God is outside of time, and for us everything is like you know past and present and future and, and so on. But God is outside of this whole concept of time itself, and He enters into time. Right. So that is something for us to. You know, for us to understand, for us to, I mean, I know it's a difficult concept, right? How can somebody be outside of time? But that's because he's infinite, right? Uh, that is who God is. And therefore, it, you know, all these things being prepared even before the foundations, the sacrifice being prepared even before the foundations of the earth, it makes sense, right? So we see all this coming together right in just, just the gate. 
Okay. Then we saw the outer court. You know, if you remember the picture that I we just showed, saw that we see that that was the outer court. <clears throat> Let me just uh, share that again, and then we'll take a uh, take a look at that. Share that picture again. Okay. Um, okay. So we see the outer court. <clears throat> So what is there? Very prominent there are two two things. One is the brazen altar, or an altar. You know, this is how the Lord says, "This is how this altar shall be made." Okay, if you look at Exodus twenty-seven, it says, "You shall make an altar," and he specifies the kind of wood, acacia wood, specifies the measurements and the design. Okay, the material, the measurements, the design. The altar shall be square. Its height shall be like this. You shall make it's uh, you shall make its horns on the four corners so it it will have something like a you know pointed like a horn like of uh, of an animal a pointed uh, structure a horn on the four corners and it 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 shall be overlaid with bronze so it's wooden but it shall be overlaid with bronze so <clears throat> it is overlaid meaning you know it's it's completely covered with bronze okay so it's the altar of sacrifice. So altar, we looked at altar. So it's a place of sacrifice, a place of death, a place of slaughter. And um, so it's a place of surrender as well. So when we look at all this, it's, it's, it's where we willingly give up our rights, where we surrender, a place where we say, you know, I'm, I'm giving myself, I'm yielding myself. I'm surrendering. So it starts with that. You enter only through the gate, and it's a place. The first thing that a person would encounter is that altar of sacrifice, the brazen altar. Okay. Um, some uh, sorry, uh, Hebrews 13 talks about this. By him, 1315, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips. So this sacrifice of praise in the new testament it is the sacrifice of praise because that sacrifice the perfect sacrifice is already done right the sacrifice that would take away the sin of the world is already done right so whenever the sacrifice was made on the altar and uh, it represented the sin or the sinner uh himself or herself being on the altar right and the sin which was which were, which would have trapped the sinner which would have brought the sinner down you know it represented that as well being brought to the altar that's something that would be dealt with right so every time a person would see that um, the person would understand that if this is the payment for sin this is where the sinner would end up actually this is the seriousness of it, and it results in death. So it refer referred to the sinner, referred to the, you know, the, the sin itself, and the whole thing of the blood being taken in, you know, the blood referring to the atonement, the covering, which would which would actually cover sin, right? Which would which God would overlook, right? But but this was something that was demanded. To cover, uh, to cover sin, right? To take away sin, uh, to, to even kind of, um, you know, so that God would not look at it, or God, for a time being, that God would not deal with it, right? So this whole atonement, we see that um, right there at the uh, altar, right, the bronze altar. Then. <clears throat> uh, if, if you want to read a, f a few more about the altar, we can we can look at it. Probably we can um, read through in yeah, verse twenty. Um, sorry, chapter twenty-seven and verse one. You shall make an altar of acacia wood, five cubits long, five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. You shall make its horns on its four corners. Its horn shall be of one piece with it, and you shall overlay it with bronze. Also, you shall make its pans to receive its ashes. So they're going to burn something. So the ashes 
uh, would would fall down uh, onto the pan and to cover, the pan is there to collect it and its shovels and its basins and and its forks and its fire pans you shall make all utensils of bronze you shall make a grate for it a network of bronze and on the network you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners you shall put it under the rim of the altar beneath and the network shall be midway up the altar you shall make poles for the altar poles of acacia wood and overlay them with bronze and these poles shall be put in the rings and the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it so that people can carry it you shall make it hollow with boards as it was shown you on the mountains show so shall they make it okay so very specific again instructions how the altar should be okay then when we when we look at um, the other thing we see that there is a what you call as a laver or a big basin which has water for a ceremonial washing right? okay so let's look at that okay the bronze it is again made of bronze this altar is also made of bronze so the lord sp speaks to moses saying you shall make a laver of bronze and this is in verse 17 right um or sorry uh, uh, of ch chapter 30 uh, it talks about that about the washing so he says you shall make a laver of bronze and its base also of bronze for washing you shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar you shall put water in it for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it when they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near the altar to minister to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord they shall wash with water lest they die so they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die and it shall be a statute forever to them to him and his descendants throughout their generations okay so it's a place of washing cleansing hands feet etc right to to wash away all the impurities of the day right literally when they walk when they move around there is this dirt which is there on the hands and feet and especially in the feet and um and then the lord is saying that okay they they should have this cleansing they should have this um, washing and this water will will enable them to do that right and so we see a uh, reference to that again in scripture right that the word of god is a wash, washing by the water of the word we say in if we see in Ephesians. probably we can look at that word Ephesians 5 right Ephesians 5 and uh, i think it's verse 26 Yeah, Ephesians 5 and verse 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse her, referring to the church, the cleanser with the washing of water by the word. Okay, so there's a washing that, so which means the word of God, there is a cleansing, there's a washing away of impurities that happens uh, whenever somebody engages with the word of God. Engages meaning reading. Or maybe some you're hearing the word, you're taking the word of God. So there is a cleansing, there is a purifying thing that happens because of the water of the word, right? Um, therefore, the importance again in the New Testament times, it's symbolic of this washing, cleansing act of God um, for man through his word, right? So that that is again something that happens. Okay. Then there was something that se separated the outer court from the inner court. There was a there was a curtain that separated the outer court from the inner court. Okay. So what else do we see there? In, once we move journey from the outer court into the inner court, right? We see that we move into the the holy place, right? That is a that is a section that we see the holy place, and there are certain things that are kept there. Okay, so first we look at this table which has bread on it okay this table which has fresh bread on it and uh, and again there is uh, i think in yeah exodus 26 verse 30 talks about some of the things that how the table should be okay so he says you shall raise up the tabernacle according to the pattern you shall set the table outside the veil 
and the lamp stand across from the table. So it's not it's not a random placement inside that, right? The table is there, the show with the showbread, and across that, opposite that, is the lamp stand, right? And it's also the direction, right? Across the from the table on the south side of the tabernacle, on the side of the tabernacle towards the south, and you shall put the table on the north side, right? So uh, obviously the entrance is to the east, so north and south. Okay, so you shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle woven of blue, purple, scarlet, fine woven, you know, that we saw just now, right? Okay, then he says uh, about the bread, uh, he says uh, that the show bread, they would, they would actually bake fresh loaves right? and uh, they would keep it there. The old loaves, okay, they would, they would, which means they would replace it. They would come, replace it, uh, leave, replace because obviously, you know, the the old ones they would replace it with the fresh ones, and uh, the priests actually were allowed to eat the old loaves while standing in the holy place. They could actually eat it, and apparently, you know, Le Leviticus twenty two talks about that. They would sprinkle frankincense on the bread, and it would taste bitter, and they would eat it. Okay. And um, and so on. So the there would be according to some of the traditions, it says that the priests would hold hands and they change bread and and uh, it would also represent fellowship and so on. Okay. So so bread, okay, uh, uh, something that nourishes, something that uh, satisfies, something that uh, is gives us strength. Again, referring to the word of God, right? Um, Matthew chapter six. The Lord Jesus, when he um, talked about the prayer, right? Uh, so he talks about uh, talks about natural provision. Matthew six, verse um, verse eleven, and give us this day our daily bread. Obviously, referring to natural provision, uh, physical provision, right? But it's also we know that that we are saying that Lord. We need your spiritual food. Okay. And Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, the Lord Jesus talks about that, talks about the spiritual food. And he says, Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, referring to Deuteronomy 8 3, right? He's quoting from that. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Okay. So he's referring to uh, the difference between the the bread of life he is referred to as the bread of life uh, and uh, he's saying man shall not live by this physical bread alone but by every word right that comes from the word of mouth of god excuse me john chapter 6 talks about the lord when he's introducing himself he says i am the bread of life right um, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. So, obviously, he's talking about a you know a hunger that goes beyond natural hunger, right? He's talking about spiritual hunger. He's saying it. He who comes to me shall never hunger again. Spiritually, you will not you know go after any other thing when you come and meet with Jesus, the bread of life, right? And uh, John chapter six, um, he again uh, John chapter four. He's in, in his conversation with the with the Samaritan woman, he's talking about himself and he's saying, you know, I will give this water and he who drinks shall never thirst again. So he's talking about the, the spiritual hunger or spiritual search that people are on, you know, for something meaningful, for purpose and for answers, uh, you know, and, and destiny itself, right? And that comes from the Lord. So he's saying, I am the bread. So... These these show bread is represented Lord Himself, represented the eternal Word, the Word of Life, the bread of life. Right? It's again, amazing how so many centuries before or millennia before that this happened uh, in the wilderness, and the Lord is you know the Lord gave this design of show bread. Right, referring to Jesus Himself. Okay, 
So what was opposite of the showbread? What was on the south side? What do you see there? What do you see there? We see the table of showbread. Uh, to the south of it, what do you see? You can look at, uh, okay, I, I haven't shared this with the online. Yeah, there is the lampstand, right? Or what you what we call as the, uh, the menorah or the, it, it has seven, uh, seven lamps or seven, um, you know, seven lamps on it. It's just like, it's like a seven headed, like a lampstand. It's called the menorah, right? So, so that is burning there. That never goes out. That is burning, right? Always. So this, this again, the design is given and design is about, you know, uh, how it should be with gold. What is the pattern of it and so on. So uh, apparently twice every day, morning and evening, a priest would come, attend to the wick, like, and, uh, and pour oil into it. Now, this oil was supposed to be pure olive oil, uh, crushed olive oil, and uh, and so on the lamp there was this oil that was poured. The fire was lit. They would, uh, you know, it. So it was, it was a, a type and a symbol of the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, oil always referred to the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so. The work of the Holy Spirit, now it's lighting up that entire place. The lamp is lit. The work of the Holy Spirit lighting up. And it's it's lighting up significantly. If you look at it, it's lighting up that area. And particularly the table which is there with the bread. Right. So what do you think that signifies? The work of the Holy Spirit lighting up or revealing the word. Right, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, revealing what the Word actually offers to us, you know, or what is, what the Word is about, and we we see that yes, the Holy Spirit is the one who is the, all Scripture is God breathed. Everything is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and so we see that the Holy Spirit's ministry is to bring light to the Word, right? Bring light to us. Sorry, bring light to us. Our understanding of the word. So it's only by this lamp, this is the only source of light inside that place. Now we, we saw that it is covered by curtain. So what gives illumination to that area is this lamp, the seven wicked lamp or seven, seven, you know, headed lamp. So this is the only thing that would give light. And this was, um, you know, the light would never go out and, and so on. So it's lit by this oil. Uh, what supplies oil? Uh, what supplies? You know this. Uh, it is fueled by this oil, which is olive oil, and so on. Okay, so we again signifying the ministry, the revelatory work of the Holy Spirit. One of the titles of the Holy Spirit is that He's the Spirit of wisdom, under revelation, and understanding. Right, understanding and revelation. So He's, uh, and the Lord Jesus Himself. You know, He says that He will show you. Right, show you things that we do not that we do not know. He will he will teach you. He will remind you. He will show you things uh, of the future and so on. So we see this again t signifying the work of the Holy Spirit. And and if you look at the placement of it and the light that shines upon those loaves, uh, and we see that it is it is important or it is necessary that it is the Holy Spirit who gives revelation about the. Word. The light from the Holy Spirit is what gives us understanding and revelation. We are able to see the word, literally see, you know, uh, spiritually see it and receive it in the light of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that is something that we understand here. Okay, so we'll take a break and then we'll come back in 10 minutes. Thanks. <laughs> 